Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. We'll get started in just a minute or two. I want to give people a little bit more time, but thank you for joining the Choice Solutions webinar with Secure Sky. We have a, a great hour planned for you, so stick around. And then for those that did join, we'll, we're, we're going to be shipping you a summer swag bag. Um, that was kind of the theme, or I guess the Saved by the Bell, the other theme that I didn't realize. But We'll get started in just a minute. Again, thank you so much for taking the time. We appreciate it. Again, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining the, the Choice Solutions and Secure Sky webinar. We'll get started in just a minute. A couple people are still joining. Uh, feel free to use the chat throughout the webinar. I think Brandon will be answering some of the questions towards the end, but again, use the chat feature. Um, and then if you haven't already, make sure to add your, your last name just so I can double check to make sure that I have attendance right. But I think we can go ahead and get started. Again, I'm Ellie. I'm the marketing manager at Choice Solutions. And so I'm going to go ahead and kick things over to Brian Steinlogge with Choice Solutions. Hey, Ellie, thank you so much, and uh, good morning. Welcome, actually, good morning, good afternoon, where did, whatever time period you're coming from. Uh, we're super excited about the content that we get to share in partnership with the Secure Sky team here today. So let me go ahead and get this over. Uh, for some of you, you might be aware of Choice Solutions, but for those of you who have not, we're gonna do just a quick, I'll hit it five minutes, just a high level who we are in partnership, but um, we were founded by Jim Steinlogge back in 1985, 1986, um, really on two principles. It's uh, doing the right thing and treating others like we wanna be treated. And so everything that we do here at Choice is based on those two principles. Where Choice serves, we're headquartered out of uh, Overland Park, Kansas, a suburb of Kansas City. But really, it's all up and down the Midwest, but also to the Southeast. And because of our skill set and because of partnerships with like Secure Sky, we actually have customers in 44 different states. Um, we've done business with over 750 customers in probably the last five to seven years. And so it's not something that we're looking to grow our business on the coast, but the reality is, is it based on the use case, based on the user, based on the opportunity. And if we like, feel like we can be, bring value, then we'll engage and uh, bring in resources and partnerships. Um, some of uh, who we serve, it's really not a specific vertical or a specific business, but you can see it goes across the industri industries from airlines to utilities to uh, hospitals, healthcare, financial. You know, um, kind of where we're at right now in the industry, it's it's kind of a dichotomy between what the users are looking for. Users are looking for anywhere access. They want to be productive where they're at, what, you know, the what, when, where that for them. And as we, you know, you look at, we got five generations of the workforce that are actually out there and they all use technology a little bit differently. Um, the business, they're trying to attract the best and the brightest, but they have to do that and to make sure that they're doing it to keep the users productive, but also to most importantly, like we're talking about today, it's got to be secure. And so there's kind of a little bit of a tension between what the users are wanting, what the businesses are trying to do. And so we try to help customers and business come up with solutions and technologies to deliver on that. All the customers that we partner with, they're somewhere on this cloud journey. Um, some of them have just started with maybe Office 365. Some of them are already got a heavy Azure footprint and are now looking to optimize that or even take that to another level with like Sentinel. And so this, the, all of them are at different spots. And so we're trying to help them understand, you know, we look at it, it's not a uh, security, it's not a light switch, but it's more of a dial. And how can we take some of these transformation te transformational technologies and how can we, every time they make an investment, increase the security for their users and their um, their their businesses. But truth being told, all of us are dealing with the same constraints. They're, they're, the, they're tr struggling to keep up with day-to-day -day tasks. They're struggling to find the right resources to keep that in-house expertise. They're struggling to keep that in-house expertise trained up. And so that's where a lot of organizations look to companies like Choice Solutions and Secure Sky to partner with them to help bring some of that knowledge and expertise and maybe even to those services to offset that. You know, really what organizations are telling us, you know, they're looking for somebody who's knowledgeable. They got proven track record. They take more of a consultative approach. They're bringing innovative, innovative ideas, not just bigger, better, faster, but really trying to look at the business challenges they're dealing with and try to bring ideas that help them. Um, I take, say, more of a quantum leap rather than a step forward, but they can actually take a leap forward. And once again, just genuine people with a customer focus. What we do, like a lot of them, is that we'll help you with, uh, you know, the next generation technology acquisition, um, evaluation of those technologies and solutions, things you should consider as we evaluate the business needs. Um, but not only along with the hardware, software solutions you might be looking at there or services, we have a professional services team that can come in and help you assess 
blueprint, architect, uh, deploy, install, and the, the services to help you get that project off and rolling. Um, where there's been really a, a big swell of a need in the industry is a, a lot of people struggling with that in-house expertise, struggling to keep up with the day-to-day -day of the businesses. Um, that's where our managed service businesses actually come out of, is there's companies that we've helped deploy these technologies, but they don't have the expertise to maintain them. And so they look for an organization like us where we come along and we see where there's a gap, maybe either in their skill set, in their personnel, or even to maybe that's a short-term or long-term need. And we take our team tools and our technologies and we wrap that into a service and bring that back in more of an OPEX fashion that they can budget appropriately for. What sets us apart, you know, obviously we have top level expertise and skill set. Uh, one thing that Choice does a really good job at is that we want to be good at what we're good at. And, um, and we want to drive a deep level of expertise, but where we're not and we don't have the strength, we establish solid relationships with companies like Secure Sky. And so rather than us trying to be um, an inch deep and a mile wide, we bring in experts like them and we can bring them in and partner with them under our services agreements. And so it's seamless to the clients and we partner on the back end to deliver, deliver solutions and technology technologies. But the other thing that too, we always try to do is strive for continuous value out through the, out the life cycle, meaning it's not a matter of just selling something and we're gone. We're trying to help you to make sure that you get that solution unpacked, make sure the business gets the full value for that investment, because we know that impacts your future projects and needs. And, you know, once again, back to our premises, always striving to do the right thing. It's something that we're people doing business with people and we value um, the opportunity to partner with the organizations. And so just like today, we appreciate your time. We're excited for a uh, Jen and Brandon and our team to be able to share with you on what they're doing and how they're helping customers, not only our, our customers, but also two customers all across the Midwest. So I get a chance to introduce now Jen Osborne. So Jen, thank you so much for your partnership and thank you guys for joining us today. Yes, thank you so much, Brian. Great overview. We really appreciate uh, you having us uh, today on the call and we're excited to talk to you guys about how Microsoft and Microsoft Sentinel are disrupting the XDR and SIM marketplace. So um, without further ado, I want to introduce Brandon Cox. He's our Director of Product Architecture, and he will be uh, doing the presenting today for everybody. Thank you. Awesome, awesome. Thanks, Jen. Thank you to Choice for inviting us. Let me just get set up on my screen sharing. Right. Boom. All right. So like Jen had mentioned, uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about how Microsoft and Sentinel are disrupting SIM XDR marketplace. Um, a lot of content to cover here. Uh, I could talk to everybody on this call for days and days. Um, and instead, I'm going to try to shove this into about 40 minutes. So bear with me here. We got a lot of stuff to talk about. Um, ask the questions. We'll be sure to answer them as best we can. Um, or we'll follow up with you after the webinar as well. So we'll talk a little about how Microsoft Sentinel um, integrates into Microsoft's complete extended detection and response solution. Um, Microsoft is making a pretty big splash all over the place with their security products and solutions now. Um, so we're gonna talk about how Sentinel is quickly being recognized, both Gartner and Forrester. Um, so Gartner, they're listed as the visionary for the, the last year, uh, and then Forrester, they're already listed as a leader um, in both security analytics and XDR. Uh, and then we've got a little bit of an operational insight. So basically how Sentinel is transforming the security operations space now. And really what we want to do there is talk a little about how SecureSky envisions what security operations could evolve to, what we look for um, when we're selecting uh, some of these solutions and products. Um, and then uh, demo gods, uh, you know, I, I've, I prayed enough. Hopefully the demo is going to run okay. I've got a handful of, of uh, portal screens and, and some uh, actual content to share at the end here. So just to level the playing field, um, I had to butcher some definitions, uh, basically have some one-liners on just what we're trying to accomplish with each of uh, these different products and solutions. So people are familiar with endpoint detection and response these days. An endpoint detection and response product is capable of monitoring, detecting anomalies, and automatically responding to threats. That is at, at the endpoint level. Security information and event management is, once again, a product. It is capable of consolidating data, mostly log data, from different security products. And it's designed specifically to perform security analytics, detect and alert, and then have kind of an incident management uh, portion here as well. 
Uh, there's a security orchestration automation and response component. So I have a product, once again, that is capable of performing automated information gathering, decision making, and actions. And I bring these up because now we're evolving each of these individual products into a full solution set. So you see in my first three definitions, I'm calling out product specifically, uh, but XDR, the extended detection response, we're referring to more of a solution. It is likely going to be a hodgepodge or a mix of products together that is going to be a holistic solution capable of performing monitoring, detecting anomalies, and automatically responding to threats. So if you kind of bubble this all together and you say endpoint detection and response was really cool. We had the capability on endpoints, on laptops, on phones, and everything like that to be able to detect anomalies, look for the bad, automatically perform additional investigation, automatically isolate, automatically remediate. Now, if you if you kind of extend that, extended detection response is all of the, the cool stuff that EDR has, but I'm trying to do that in other places. I'm trying to do that within cloud identity. I'm trying to do that within microservices that are running. I no longer have um, a piece of hardware that I'm interacting with. I wanna actually be able to do that in a cloud environment or in um, a SaaS environment or in, uh, you know, against a, a specific identity that is kind of isolated somewhere else or is, is a specific identity that is a user identity for my entire ecosystem. So that's kind of the concept here. So there's a lot of arguments on whether a SIM is or is not required for XDR to occur. Um, that's still kind of up in the air. Um, we are classifying SIM as a portion of the XDR solution, uh, especially within the Microsoft ecosystem. It's kind of serving as that centralized hub, especially as you're adopting products that are not Microsoft specific, there has to be some centralized point of view and Sentinel is that. So how we kind of take a look at the Microsoft XDR solution, everything on the left hand side is going to be my on premise things right so I have hardware that I'm interacting with I have endpoints that are being um, secured by Defender for Endpoint, what used to be Defender ATP. I have endpoints that are being managed by Intune. I have other third-party products that I'm gonna to want to pull into a centralized place. Right-hand side is gonna be any of my cloud environments. I have um, an Azure space, I have AWS space. Um, I'm, I want to basically have, those are absolutely viable data sources to plug in to analyze for security threats. I also want to be able to pull those in to interact with, to actually be able to perform remediation response. So those are going to all centralize then into Sentinel specifically. And so Sentinel is my data aggregation point. It is my SIM that's going to, uh, once again, collect all of my security data, all of my log data. It's going to find anomalies for me, point those out, give me a centralized place for incident management, a centralized place for investigations to occur. And then it's going to allow me to perform either automated or analyst driven responses. So I want to uh, block a user from signing in going forward. I actually wanna lock their account out or I wanna interact with a firewall. I wanna shun an IP address or anything like that. Sentinel gives me the opportunity to do that in a more automated fashion. Now, if we flip a little bit and we talk a little about market impact, um, the red circles are now where in this ecosystem, Microsoft has gained um, market awareness. They've, they've been recognized as mostly a leader in these specific areas. So endpoint, endpoint management, the security information and event management. So SIM, they're a visionary on Gartner, but uh, on Forrester, the security analytics side, they're already listed as a leader. Um, Azure Active Directory for access management, um, secure email gateway. It is, it's, it is absolutely um, a, a non, it's, it's, this is not an exhaustive list of everywhere that they are uh, uh, receiving that recognition, uh, but in this ecosystem, every place that they have been uh, recognized already. And if you take a look, just zoom out a little bit here as well. If this is the entire piece, if this is the entire XDR solution, Forrester has a brand new report um, that came out at the end of last year, and the XDR solution as a whole is now listed as a leader in the Forrester wave as well. So where does that where does that kind of occur here? So um, 
Microsoft all over the place is, is moving to, they're moving to the top, they're moving to the leaders. Uh, so here's a handful of the Forrester waves, uh, the most recent Forrester waves for each of these different categories. Extended detection and response. This is actually the first one that was released at the end of last year. Microsoft is already at the top. Um, endpoint detection and response providers. Uh, Microsoft has been a leader for, for quite some time now. Um, and then security analytics platforms. Uh, Microsoft was a leader as well. A couple of interesting things on this screen though. Um, so XDR, this is the first report that has been released by Forrester around XDR itself. Um, so this is, this is kind of a, a fresh look on what XDR is. Um, definitely would recommend taking a look into each of these reports. It's a lot of very useful information, uh, both on pros and cons, right? How these products are, and solutions work well, what to be wary of when you adopt them, and everything like that. Um, a couple of the things that we see when we're analyzing these is the release cycle and hype cycle that kind of comes along with them. Um, so each of these are released in a different cadence based on how Forrester is seeing the market change. Um, EDR has been released pretty much on a quarterly basis for quite some time because of how quickly EDR is evolving right now. Um, the security analytics platform hasn't been released since Q4 of 2020. And then once again, like I said, we have the new one of Q4 2021 for the XDR portion. So if we change gears a little bit, let's go away from Forrester. Let's talk a little bit about Gartner instead. So on the endpoint detection and response, once again, um, they're listed up as the leader. They're a leader among the leaders. Uh, access management, they're a leader. Uh, and then SIM, they are currently a visionary. Gartner treats these a little bit differently. So they tend to more release just on an annual basis. Um, and so the release cycle looks a little bit different. They're not trying to you know, cram all of this into a quarter or anything like that. What they wind up doing is they take a lot more time on evaluating the companies that they want to, or that are potentially going to be within here. Um, they set up success criteria to even be considered. And then they tend to have usually about 15 to 20 major categories in waiting that they're going to try to attack each of these companies with and, and do a scoring matrix based on that. And then each of these, and this is actually for both Forrester and Gartner, um, they are weighted based on basically how well can they execute and what is their overall strategy or completeness of vision. So one of the interesting things here we believe is you take a look at products that have been out there for a while and you can see that they are leaders among the leaders, right? They are far up in the top right corner. Um, SIM, this was actually the first time that Sentinel was evaluated by Gartner and they're already, already listed as a visionary. Now with how that release cycle winds up working though, they're being evaluated essentially on their capabilities probably close to like nine to six to nine months uh, prior to that report actually being released. So based on the release cycle for SIM, I would expect to see um, the next SIM report come out sometime this summer. Um, but when you take a look at that, one of the things you'll see that's gonna be interesting is the report is probably done now. And they are actually in more of a review phase. They're more in a phase of giving it to each of these companies first. Um, and that's how we worked. So uh, I worked at a company previously, we were rated as, uh, we were in the MSSP's quadrant back when there was one. I was part of the team that got interviewed, part of the, part of the response cycle. And so when we did it, we were interviewed um, over the summer for an end of year release. And so basically our, all of our functionality was actually being evaluated based on how we operated six months prior. Um, six months may not necessarily feel like a long time, uh, but when you're throwing as much time and money and resources at trying to evolve, six months really is a long time to, to work here. So um, I'll be interested to see how this, the new SIM um, report comes out. I, I have some, some faith that actually Microsoft is gonna to jump to leaders, but if not, it's gonna be real close on that, on that line, um, right around, uh, right around that, that, that horizontal line there of jumping from a visionary to a leader. A couple other comments, a couple of pieces here just on how Microsoft is making a security impact uh, in, in the market. Um, they have tons of numbers that you can read online about all of the different um, signals and, uh, and data points that they're evaluating to find bad things or, or to classify uh, bad activity. Um, they have 
teams that are dedicated to threat intelligence in order to enrich their products. They have teams dedicated to, uh, you know, different campaigns and, and different um, observations that they're seeing in order to make sure that all of their products and solutions are secure. Um, but as far as the scope goes for that, uh, you, you know, you think back in the day, you think about Microsoft and obviously Microsoft was Windows and Microsoft was Office and then it was Microsoft was Server. Um, Microsoft wasn't really a security company then. Microsoft is absolutely a security company now. They are a legitimate security company among the top in the world. Um, they are, uh, they recognized just last month that security is actually their number one growing annual business right now. Um, and it's already at $15 billion annually. Uh, and then over the next couple of years, they're investing billions and billions of dollars into their security products and solutions. Uh, and Sentinel is absolutely going to be one of those keys because it is serving as that centralized point uh, for all of the different products to plug into. All right, change gears here. I'm going to talk a little bit more on the technical side now. So how we have classified Sentinel um, is... It's a bunch of other Azure products that just live and have been in existence for a long, long time. So when you're interacting with Sentinel, you're actually interacting with a Azure Log Analytics workspace. It has all of the same functionality and retention and queryability and all of the different uh, pieces that live in Log Analytics. The only thing is you're stacking Sentinel on top of that. So that's that centralized piece. So think about it as if I can get data into log analytics, I can get data into Sentinel for security analytics. Now, as you zoom out from there, it winds up being just once again, a bunch of other pieces that have lived for a long, long time. So when you look at data integration, a lot of the data integration occurs by the uh, agents that are deployed on Linux and Windows. So that's going to be kind of a reflavoring of, you know, the, the, Microsoft monitoring agent it used to actually be the mom agent. So all of those wind up getting plugged into servers or, or Windows machines. They get deployed and they plug into that log analytics workspace. When you're plugging in other uh, cloud-based data sources, you might be using Azure functions to query data, or you might be using logic apps to query data or receive data and then dump it into that LA workspace as well. So it's kind of an interesting piece here is even though Sentinel is a fairly new SIM, when you think about the other products that are on, especially the MQ, um, there, you know, Splunk's been around forever and, and ArcSight's been around forever. And there's been a whole bunch of these SIMs that have been around for a long time. And even though Sentinel in, in relativity is young, the products that are actually underneath there are very mature products. And so, like I said, you're interacting with log Linux workspaces, you're interacting with machine learning service workspaces, um, and all of those wind up just being served up now, specifically focused on a security context instead. If I take that and just kind of bubble up the overall functionality, this is just a high level overview into the major functions of what Sentinel is designed to do. Um, so anything from, once again, uh, getting the data in, being able to serve up that data uh, either in a workbook fashion for your dashboards or being able to perform hunting within the hunting workbench there and find anomalies more in free form um, all the way down to an incident generates and you want to perform automated response actions either to uh, look something up on, from an external source or you want to um, and actually part of my demo here will be um, interacting with a user. They don't even have to go to Sentinel in order to perform analytics and response. It'll automatically be served up to them with external data sources with the ability to say, yes, this is good. No, this is bad. Here's what you should do. Now, when we were doing our initial evaluation of SIMs and uh, which SIM we want to kind of help sponsor and adopt uh, both for ourselves and for our customer base, uh, we had a handful of criteria that we were looking at. Um, the first one obviously was we cannot scale at hardware rates anymore. We didn't want to be um, uh, restricted to existing in a data center, having servers that were running this or anything. So we had to have a cloud native product. It had to be able to scale, quote unquote, infinitely at the rate that we were going to scale. 
But with that, we recognized, um, especially from some of our previous gigs as MSSPs, uh, we wanted to make sure that we had a flexible architecture where we could deploy regionally if we had to, based on maybe some compliance regulations or based on just necessity of who's gonna be interacting with that data. Uh, and, and obviously the other pieces here, table stakes. We wanted to be able to provide detailed insights uh, for investigations to occur. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's always a language on the back end. There's always something that you have to be able to learn in order to perform queries. Um, and each SIM winds up taking their own little spin on how investigations occur and how those especially get served up to you. And so we wanted to make sure that when we adopted a SIM, it was actually something that was going to be at least an easier way to interact with data to ask the important questions when we were interacting with it. Um, we wanted to be able to customize our data. We want to be able to customize how data was enriched. Um, and so there's obviously every single, once again, every single SIM has their own data model on the back end for how data gets queried, how you pour through the data, how you ask the questions. Um, Microsoft with their Custo query language, it is very SQL-like. Um, and so we kind of liked that because we had a whole bunch of SQL background. We wanted to be able to perform those queries. Uh, but at the same time, once that data is normalized on ingest, it makes that investigation a lot easier. It makes, you e makes it easier to ask those questions so that power users are able to jump into the deep end and perform those KQL queries as they need to. Um, but it usually just wants to hop in, you know, a tier one analyst wants to hop in and just ask a couple of quick questions on what's occurring in the incident. We wanted to make sure that that was also uh, relatively easy. The other piece to this is we didn't just want to evaluate, you know, quote unquote threat data or, or transaction or traffic anymore. We wanted to be able to observe contextually what is happening. We wanted to be able to roll in threat intelligence. Is this actually something that is observed more in the wild? Uh, we wanted to be able to roll in patch and state and vulnerability data to say uh, this attack was occurring and also Defender for Endpoint says that this actually is vulnerable to this, or uh, you know, this actually is not patched against this attack right now. Um, and so being able to evaluate not just the state of the attack, but how impactful was it to that machine or to that identity uh, that was actually being uh, attacked in that incident. Um, another key piece here was, this kind of rolls into some of the investigation. Um, there's a lot of context around, especially entities and users that are available now. And Microsoft has a, a unique perspective because so many people have um, Azure Active Directory as their primary identity. So being able to tie Azure AD and all of what Azure AD knows about a user and actually just have that automatically available to you uh, when you're performing analysis. So I don't just have a user anymore with, a, with a, an email address. I actually have who that user is, what groups that user is part of. I have um, what roles that user has been assigned, who, that man, who the manager of that user is. I have where they're physically located. Uh, so all of that winds up being rolled in during the investigation process, as well as on individual user and entity behavior analytics pages, so that you can get better insights into what's occurring for a specific user, uh, not necessarily based on transactions, but based on just what the company knows about that user. And an interesting thing that we're seeing that Microsoft is expanding is not just Azure Active Directory anymore. They wanna be able to pull in your HR system. They wanna be able to pull in everything they can to be able to know as much as they can about that user. Uh, and then the last piece here is more of an operational functionality. Um, resources are tight, right? Choice brought it up at the very beginning. We wanted to make sure that the product that we wanted to kind of help sponsor was really going to augment what operators can actually do now. Um, and so if we're able to take our tier one staff and, um, you know, I, I worked in a SOC for a while and I worked, I didn't work overnights, so I worked second shift. So I was more of the afternoon, but, you know, you, you interact with the people in the SOC and tier one SOCs a lot of times are the ones that are able to, you know, perform three or four investigations. And then they want to be able to do a tier one response, which is block the user so that 
you know, just stop the bleeding, just start the triage so that we can, uh, you know, stop the user for stop the attacker from progressing, but allow the investigation to occur. In this day and age, we feel that the tier one can then move on to a deeper, maybe tier one can actually move up to more of a tier two or tier three with their investigations, because tier one actions should be automated. I should be able to have enough context in the use cases that I'm building to actually be able to perform the investigation, to be able to automatically say, because of X, Y, and Z, this is known bad, and therefore this user should be blocked out. Uh, you know, this user should be locked out. This user should be blocked from signing in. This user should be reprompted to multi-factor, uh, something to just disrupt that attacker from being able to progress. That's a, a lot of just table stakes for, for tier one response these days. And therefore, those are the use cases that Sentinel is amazingly built to be able to do just out the gate, especially with how it integrates with a lot of the other products that companies just wind up having, like Azure Active Directory. All right, so from here, um, the other piece that I wanted to make sure that I talked about is just because Sentinel is a newer product, um, they had a lot of catching up to do. Even though they had a lot of these you know, pieces that were here and there, the Log Analytics workspace already lived. They already had Logic Apps. They already had Azure Functions. They already had the agent for collection. Um, they still had to unify all of that, and they had to kind of present it in a way that is recognizable by the market to be a sim. So as Microsoft was evolving their product, this is kind of how we saw it occur. So first off was, what are the table stakes to just be called a SIM? And that was the first thing that they worked on. And the reason I bring that up is because you think about all the way back when I was talking about that Forrester Q4 of 2020 report, Sentinel was really, really, really new. And it was already listed as a leader in security analytics. Um, so all Microsoft was doing at that point was, what, are the, what do I have to do to be called a SIM? That's just SIM parity with all of the other SIMs that are out there. Now that they have that, the evolution has kind of taken a turn. And that evolution has been in, in cycles. And it's basically been, what additional functionality can we provide? And then we, we kind of package that all together. And then we turn that into, okay, now how do I make that easier to use. And so uh, a sample of that is additional functionality for data sources. So Microsoft reached out their feelers for partners and they said, who can help get additional data sources into Sentinel so that we can perform an, uh, analytics? Uh, and, and so a lot of vendors stepped up and they said, yeah, we want to play. We want to have our data in there with, with, the, rest of the, with the rest of the players. Let's, let's go ahead and get, get going. From there, um, there were, there were products that were deployed. So when you go out and you try to plug in something like Salesforce right now or Cisco Umbrella right now, it is a data connector that actually lives more like an Azure function that is going to query those other data sources. Um, so that was step one, just function. Now they're moving to ease of use on those. So now it is not an Azure function. They're actually moving those to be just ingrained native pieces of Sentinel that are point, click, click. It's not additional functionality. It's not even additional resources you're deploying on the back end. It's something that's just going to live in Sentinel. And so we saw that all over the place on how Microsoft was evolving. They said, I want to do function, and then I want to make that function easier. I want to do function, and I want to make that function easier. Um, workbooks to templates, and then they wanted to have more community-driven, and then they, they're now rolling in some of the, what, if, what the community is actually creating. Um, another big one that we're absolutely hopping on the bandwagon right now is the ability to roll out function with kind of the infrastructure as code concept. I want to plug into Azure DevOps or I want to plug into GitHub. I don't want to have to deploy my individual pieces uh, in the interface of Sentinel. I want that to be more centrally managed in a repository. And then as I make changes, I can actually benefit from all of the, all of the other pieces that my repository has. I have the ability to roll back changes. I have the ability to approve changes and push them to production and everything like that. Um, so once again, it's kind of that evolution of moving to um, additional functionality. And then how do we make that additional functionality easier to consume? All right, um, I have been in my head praying to the demo gods this whole time while I've been talking. So I'm gonna go ahead and switch over to some of the, um, some of the live things that I wanted to showcase here. 
Now keep in mind that in the time that I have left, I probably cannot do Sentinel much justice just because I'm gonna be a little bit limited on time, but I did have a handful of things I wanted to show you guys today. All right, first off is um, just connecting data in. So this is a really unique method of connecting data and Microsoft is kind of moving it to a way of being able to classify what data I wanna pull in and where that data is going to live. Um, so on my screen, uh, once again, if I start talking about the functionality first, um, in our demo, we've got a handful of different products in. We've got a bunch of Microsoft stuff. We have uh, servers, we have AWS, we've got some DNS pieces, um, we've got a threat intelligence source. Uh, but one of the things that was really interesting here was if you actually watched how this evolved, uh, Microsoft is now allowing for a better selection of what data you want to pull in. So if I actually just focus on the M365 Defender section for a second, I have the granularity of being able to choose within the 365 Defender space all of the different components individually and what I'm actually interested in analyzing. And this is really beneficial for, for multiple reasons. One is now I have a whole bunch of data that I can pull into. Um, another is I have the ability to more granularly select what data is, is available because Azure, Azure Sentinel is a complete consumption-based model here. So as you're ingesting data, that's what you're paying to Microsoft. That's what you're paying on your Azure bill. So if I wind up finding that there's data pieces that aren't as beneficial and I wanna pair those out because I want to do a little bit of cost savings, I have the ability to do so. Uh, but within this piece here, I have Defender for Endpoint, a whole bunch of different device types or a whole bunch of data sources, I'm sorry. Uh, Defender for Office 365, Defender for Cloud Apps, Defender for Identity, and there's this new one. So once again, expansion on the functionality, we found that these individually had a lot of good transaction data, but a lot of the incidents that were actually generating out of the Defender stack were not providing a lot of information that is, that, that's good detection. You know, I could actually see all of the transactions that were occurring, but it was it was more difficult to maybe uh, connect the dots on what was actually being classified as an incident in Defender 365. Now we have a separate Defender alert evidence and all this is designed to do is actually extract all of the pieces out of these other tables and put them into a centralized spot so that I can say, this is the evidence that's actually calling out this as being malicious. So this, this is being suspicious activity. So each of these winds up being um, a, a big expansion spot. And now where Microsoft is moving from an ease perspective now is, you know, I have, I have data that's coming in. Okay, now do I, what do I actually wanna do with that data? So they're expanding their next steps. That's one piece. But the other thing that they're doing is they're more rolling this out as content hubs. They're moving this into content packages. So I want to onboard Cisco Umbrella. I want to onboard Cisco Umbrella. I have a Cisco Umbrella package now that says I have the ability to roll out the data connector. I have the ability to roll out, let me go ahead and run through this here, the data connector, the parser, the um, analytics workbook, the dashboard. I want to roll out all of the different analytics rules that are going to be interesting or important for Umbrella. I want to roll out all of the hunting queries that I want to have live in my workbench. I want to roll out all of the playbooks that I might want to actually do to integrate and provide response. All of these wind up being centralized as one click to deploy. There's still, con especially on the playbooks, there's still configuration you're going to have to do. There's still management of the connections and approvals of the service accounts and everything like that. But overall, the content itself on where do I start is all served up to you with just a couple of clicks. So once again, you think about the functionality of all of this just living there and then moving this now to a centralized place where I can more easily interact with it. I have more ease, I have more ease of access and templates to be able to actually interact with this. Uh, next interesting one that I wanted to make sure that I called out is the ways that Microsoft is serving up um, investigations. So 
without even needing to actually interact with raw log data. I don't have to perform queries. I don't have to write out queries. I don't have to learn KQL. I had an incident that generates, and these are all of the important pieces of the incident. So I had an incident that was a custom network indicator that was essentially a blacklist. I have all of the pieces that occurred for that incident. I have the processes. I have the user. I have the machine that it was on. A couple of cool things here. So talking a little bit about that user and entity piece, I want to have, so who is this eQuick user? I just want to click on it. There we go. I want to click on it. And here's all of the information that's been extracted directly out of Azure Active Directory. So I know that eQuick is um, Edward Quick, actually. And I know that eQuick reports to Corey, and he is in the Cyber Threat Center, Center, and he is a security engineer. And I have all of the groups that he's part of. I have all of the, all the different pieces within here. So now I have context. I don't have just this happened to a user. I have a little bit more information on if this was bad, who, you know, how would this have actually impacted my, my uh, company? I have the machine that occurred on, and I can actually ask additional pieces of that machine just once again, right out the gate. So who usually logs into this? Where do they usually log in from? Here's my component. So eQuick usually logs into this machine, usually logs in from these IP addresses. Well, here's an IP address. What, where is that IP address ge geographically located? They're in Nebraska. Oh, well, we're in Nebraska. So that's, at least it's not a, a crazy foreign address, right? So there's a bunch of different pieces that I can interact with here. And the other thing that's really nice that Microsoft has served up is, you can actually sort right out the gate. So uh, this might not be interesting. This might not be interesting. You can kind of use this like a mind mapping piece too, just to directly interact with all of these different components. And then especially when URLs are involved, I can actually see what the URL verdict was. So I don't have to go to hybrid analysis. I don't have to go to Joe Sandbox or VT anymore. I have the ability to say, this was the URL. It was a, it was a good verdict. This happens to be a redirect just to the Microsoft tech community. Here's what that looks like. So what does that look like if it's actually bad then? So if I hop over to a different one, um, this one was higher priority. You can tell by it's all sorts of red instead of my informational one being gray. A lot of the same pieces, I have a user, I have Arthur, this is what Arthur does, this is who Arthur is. But I also now have a separate URL. And this URL was actually called bad. This, it, it didn't necessarily redirect, so I have the source, I have the destination, but it was, uh, uh, it did have a bad verdict associated with it. And yeah, that doesn't necessarily look as good as just going to the Microsoft tech community anymore, right? So I have a little bit more evidence to show me what occurred. Now, here's where this is really nice. Think about short-lived URLs, right? This actually happened at the time of the detonation at the time of the incident is when it actually performed this. So I don't have to worry about when I analyze this 10 minutes later, an hour later, um, anything like that about that URL being down. This is actually snapshotted. It's now part of this incident. So it is, it's actually cataloged within here. Just a really interesting piece. All right, last piece I wanted to make sure that I talked about with you guys going a little bit further into the weeds is more on the automation side. So because of how Logic Apps works, and if you're not familiar with Logic Apps, it is really just if this, then that framework. It is just a whole bunch of decisions and logic that you put together. And you have decisions that are made based on you know, content that occurs in the previous steps that are made. Um, and you can have it do pretty much anything that you want it to. In this case, uh, I've got a use case of, I have an incident that generates for a user, and I actually want to query Azure Active Directory to see if this user was also deemed as risky. And then I'm going to actually serve up that entire response to me in Teams instead. So now I'm actually disassociating from Sentinel as in I'm going to, you know, portal.azure.com and I'm interacting with Sentinel and I have to actually go and mark the incident or have to investigate itself or anything like that. I'm actually having all of this fed to me via Teams. So I have a team spun up. I have it, uh, an automated account send me the information and then I can interact with it directly out of Teams. So uh, how that looks from kind of this if this then that 
piece. I have the incident. I'm extracting the entities from the incident. I have to extract the account from the entities. I'm now querying Azure Active Directory. Is there a risky user here? I have to compose all of that information into JSON to feed it up to me. And then I have all of these case statements. So it's then, how do you want to interact with this? Is this is this a user that's actually compromised? Should we lock them out from here? Should we dismiss this risk? Should we update the incident? Should we close the incident? And so at a high level, this is what that looks like from a kind of a programming perspective. If I actually serve this up within Teams though, this is how that looks. So I have, this is a sample. So I have my, this is the user that was marked as risky. I have, this was their user uh, this was their username. I have, this was the risk detail, some of the information that we saw. The user is currently at risk. How do you want to respond? Do you actually want to interact with Azure Active Directory, confirm this user is compromised and have the risky component actually start its chain of events where I'm performing sign-offs, I'm performing, uh, you know, multi-factor authentication, I'm, I'm forcing a user to reset passwords and everything like that. Do I want to actually change anything within the incident in Sentinel as well, because now these are linked together. So I can actually close this incident if I want to do anything with it. I can change the incident uh, severity. There's other pieces. This was just kind of the, the other piece I wanted to extract out of here. Or I can just go directly back to the incident in the link. So if this isn't enough information for me to be served up in order to actually you know, have my investigation occur and be able to make my decision, I want to hop in and perform additional analysis I can also do so then. All right, a lot of different pieces here that I wanted to make sure that I covered with you guys. That's the end of my portion. I definitely thank you for bearing with me for the last uh, 40 minutes or so. Um, and I'm gonna stop and I'm gonna send it back to Jen and Ellie. Hey, Brandon, we, we did have um, a question. Oh, and I, let's see. They were wondering if you could speak a little bit more about ingestion costs into Sentinel and how how to think about the value of the different sources or items that you would choose to bring in and ingest. Absolutely. Um, that is a, a very deep conversation that we get into a lot. And um, this is a consumption-based model, right? So what I mean by that is if you're ingesting, you're ingesting at a per gig rate and obviously everybody is a little bit different. Um, so I can't necessarily talk about pricing if you have an enterprise agreement with Microsoft or based on what region you're in, but it is absolutely 100% consumption. A um, couple pieces that we tend to go through here is uh, we always start with, you, if there's any sort of compliance regulation that's gonna force you to have a standard set of data that winds up being, being pulled in, that unfortunately has to trump everything. So if there's anything that winds up falling within compliance that's going to drive you to have at least a, a baseline of what gets ingested, then, then that winds up being the, that, that, that's basically the end of the conversation at that point. From there, um, the value comes by use cases that you're gonna define. So let's say you're not part of any sort of compliance regulation, you have full spectrum uh, uh, capabilities of just stating whatever it is that you want to dump in. Um, what you really, what we wind up getting into conversations with customers about is uh, the use cases that we're going to be forming, performing detection within. If it's more of the on-premise, the legacy on-premise, and you have that, you know, hard outer shell, then you're going to be talking a lot more about ingesting firewall logs, you're ingesting server logs, and each of those components winds up being, once again, driven by the use case. Um, what we tend to do in our analysis when we get, in, when we get into it with customers is um, Microsoft has a lot of trial offers for different users to be able to consume at either a lower or no cost. So as long as you can actually operate within that window, you're actually able to operate at a lot lower cost to be able to feed in as much as you can and then pair out. Um, we tend to go more that route because we don't want to assume that we're going to step in knowing everything. We don't want to walk in assuming that we're going to have uh, the right level of visibility. So we say, let's get as much data as we can. And then we do volume analysis and we say, oh, this has a whole bunch of specific message number and, and 
use cases that I'm going to get into now are going to be like, we saw a whole bunch of, you know, network shares that were being accessed because you've got extended file auditing on that you don't necessarily need on. Let's start talking audit policies. So that's kind of where we get into it is we, we tend to put as much as we can to start. And then we start pairing back based on that volume. And that's, that just winds up being, where's my low hanging fruit. So I have a whole bunch of, um, Another use case that we do is I have a whole bunch of firewall traffic that's accepting, you know, DNS, but I also have my DNS server in, so it's kind of duplicative. So I can actually drop the, the firewalls, for example, drop the specific firewall packets. So there's a little bit of, it's definitely a little bit of a, of a gray area, but every single one of those happens to be, you know, the general concept of get the data in and then start pairing back. One of the things that I would add there is as you, if you choose to consume other Microsoft products, you also wind up getting price breaks. So hit the Microsoft websites and take a look at those. As you start adopting Defender for Cloud, as you're an, if you're an E5 shop, you actually wind up getting additional price breaks as well. So no, there's another piece there too. Brandon, we had a question um, asking if there are limitations in Sentinel as to maybe what you can see if you're not utilizing Intune, for example. Um, you do, there is no, I was actually trying to find that question because I thought I saw it here as well. Do, 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 do. You do, uh, there's no requirement on in tune um, in order to do this. And actually, especially if you're doing server monitoring, that's gonna be more pushed out, more probably like a GPO instead. Um, or if you have just a handful, there's silent installers that you can do. Um, so, so there's definitely no requirement on Intune. If you do have Intune and you wind up using Intune to ingest say your um, Defender for Endpoint, there's definitely some, some plugins and ease of deployment then. Um, so there's definitely an Intune play, but it is absolutely not a requirement. And then they were asking if there's a certain Microsoft license level needed to get the visibility in Sentinel that you were dem demonstrating today. Um, the only license requirement that really is going to play into effect um, of what I talked about today. So I, I, I talked about a bunch of Microsoft products, absolutely. And so there's Defender for Endpoint, which is obviously a product that you're purchasing and things of that nature. But when I talk about, especially the identity and the context, the only requirement is Azure Active Directory P1. So the, the auditing on Azure Active Directory does not exist, doesn't have the plugins available at basic. So you have to be at least a P1 shop for, uh, for that piece. But once again, the rest of that is, it, it's all its all product driven. And I thought I saw a question about Sophos as well there. Um, yeah, yeah, so it supports Sophos, it supports a lot of other endpoint tools. And the nice thing about those is when you're deploying to a server, you wanna consume server logs, right? So deploying to a server, consuming server logs means I'm extracting from the event viewer and sending it up. The, the concept is different on the endpoint because the endpoints usually have a centralized management console that I'm going to be extracting from instead. So Defender for Endpoint, I'm going to be pulling from the Defender for Endpoint console. Sophos, I'm pulling from Sophos Central and everything of that nature. Or Palo Alto Cortex XDR, another one, absolutely. Yeah, so I'm actually pulling from those centralized products rather than trying to consume from each individual endpoint directly. And did you see the question from Brian? Is there an autom is there automation as it relates to removing a data source? Let's say you decommission a server. Um, so uh, that that's a that's a great question, and I, I'm gonna, I got to flip that just a little bit. So the way that Microsoft works is it is with these agents, especially is you're deploying kind of a shell, and the shell is just the agent that says I have to be installed, and I actually phone home to Sentinel to tell me what to do, what to collect, what the frequency to collect and everything like that is. So there's nothing in Sentinel that is actually gonna say that a machine should or should not be plugged in. There's actually more of workbooks that are gonna show you that machines are or are not feeding in just for device health purposes. Um, but if you have a, a machine you actually wanna decommission, it's quite as simple as either uninstalling the agent, stopping the agent, or just removing the registry entries that are associated with that, once again, that phone home.
Um, there was a question that asks, can you elaborate on ingesting HR data? Is there a recommended approach? Um, so Microsoft is just now releasing a lot of the documentation around not just what information they want to be pulling, but the vendors that they are going to be actually partnering with in order to do so. Um, so last that I checked, we're actually on NDA with Microsoft on uh, in some of their private preview stuff. So I can say that they are working and I know that there's a handful of vendors that they want to pull in, but they are, but they're actually still, it is actually still a work in progress on, on what is actually going to get pulled in. I will say that it's all going to be a centralized concept here. So you have something like Workday that's going to be your central HR. There's going to be a plug into Workday to extract that. And what Microsoft is doing is they're trying to serve that up more automatically. So the recommended approach, the recommended data to be pulled in is going to be quite simply just a data connector that's going to live, that it's just going to pull the data in that Microsoft needs. Let's see. Um, Jim had a question. Is Rapid7 Insight VM supported for vulnerability data? They currently use Insight IDR as their XDR platform, but are also considering Sentinel. And then asking about long-term log data storage and how that's handled. Um, on the Rapid7, I uh, James, we're going to have to follow up with you on that one. I don't recall. I know that uh, they're, they're expanding the vulnerability side. So we're gonna have to follow up with you on that one. Retention is a great question and retention is handled in a lot of different ways. So uh, the concept of hot, you can actually have just hot data that lives there for two years uh, is, the, is the max for hot data. Um, now you think about on the back end, this is a lot of table storage. So you can actually customize, not just globally how you want to have that hot storage live, but you also have the ability to narrow in and say which tables are more important to have for hot longer. And so we tend to do things like identity is going to be really important. I might want to have my Azure AD logs for a longer period of time than something that's a lot more voluminous that is not going to provide as much value. Firewall logs, right? Firewall logs are important, but if I'm going to try to keep two years of firewall logs hot, that's going to cost me a chunk of change. And we want to try to reduce that. Um, in those cases that you still want to have the data, you absolutely have the data um, available in an archival state now. And so you ingest and then you dump to archive. And the archive is something that winds up being, they call it rehydration. So you say, I want to rehydrate or re-ingest data at a specific interval. I basically just choose the table and I choose the time frame, and then it serves it back up to me to re-query through as if it were hot. Um, there's a couple of other cost metrics that Microsoft is now just rolling out, like they've rolled out this new concept of what they call basic logs, where basic logs have the ability to ingest at a very, very fraction. It's, it's kind of, it's pretty close to like a tenth of the cost, but I can't perform analytics against it. I have some of the compute function actually doesn't work. It's really, it's really um, ingesting for con for context. So you think about something that's going to be high volume that I don't necessarily need to be able to perform security analytics. Um, we've had a lot of customers that have asked us about flow, for example, and I feel that flow is a great example here of being able to ingest for context, but I want to put it at a basic level because I don't necessarily want to pay for flow to go into Sentinel just because of that volume. Um, we have another question. Um, is there a mechanism to alert or notify on endpoints that have not reported in after a period of time? Yes, absolutely. So there's two different ways to do it. Um, and this really depends on how you want to interact. So there is one just flat a dashboard and the dashboard is going to say you had 10 servers in the past 30 days, and now you're at nine servers, right? And there's kind of just a little bit of a differential analysis on the workbook. So on the dashboard, that's going to show you. Otherwise, if you actually want more of like a real-time alerting structure, there absolutely is. So you would it would be pretty similar. So it would be, um, we don't necessarily, we recommend more along the lines of um, doing differential analysis. So in the past month, I had you know, 10 machines from the past month, I saw these machines and now I don't. And that winds up being a little bit more dynamic than doing like a per device alert, uh, but you can do either one. It absolutely is flexible in doing that. 
It sounds like uh, Jim had another question. How is the architecture handled with hybrid Azure AD? Are you able to elaborate on that a little, a little bit? So um, if I would kind of talk while you're typing, uh, I would say that it's aware of, of, of actually all three perspectives and all three perspectives. What I mean by that is I have an Azure uh, that I'm plugged into to get the, the different log data. If I have a hybrid where I also have domain controllers on prem that are going to be serving that up i'm getting those logs as well just because they don't the logs don't necessarily sync it depends on where i'm logging in from um, and then a big piece here that third component that i and i absolutely i recommend this to everybody that has a domain controller defender for identity um, is the other component that i'm referring to where i'm actually doing a lot of that cloud-based anomaly detection actually on a domain controller instead i think you got it <laughs> All right, I know that we are just at the top of the hour here. Um, I thank you, everybody. I love the questions. Hopefully, uh, this was this was beneficial for you guys. I uh, definitely appreciate everybody bearing with me. I'm gonna I'm gonna send it back over to uh, uh, to Ellie. Well, on behalf of the both the the choice and the secure secure sky team thank you guys so much brandon you did a phenomenal job thank you for sharing your wisdom and like i said if there's additional questions obviously our teams will be reaching out both jen and my teams will be reaching out and seeing how we can either schedule some follow-up conversations with you about some of the things that brandon touched on or other questions that we can kind of wade into and see how we can be a value or, or support so we we greatly appreciate your partnership um, we value your business and we uh, wish you guys all a amazing day thank you for joining Thanks. Bye, guys.